Our guest speaker has also had a tremendous influence upon us for good. He is a Rhodes Scholar. He is also currently a leadership candidate for the Liberal Party of Canada. He has received numerous awards which are set out here and I won't repeat it. But one little bit of adventure that he's had. He's been to Iraq twice for the Forum of Federations. The fact that he's managed to come back and that he went back a second time speaks to his dedication for the spread of democracy and speaks to his dedication to seeing to it that the rule of law, the good law, not the bad law, the good influence, not the bad influence, are spread. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my very great pleasure to present the Honorable, the very Honorable, Bob. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I can assure you it's, it's uh, very daunting uh, to stand at this bima, uh, and it's particularly daunting to stand in front of all of you uh, on, uh, on this occasion. Uh, but I am uh, very honored uh, to have been asked uh, to, uh, to, uh, to give this talk. Uh, for any of you who are even remotely suspicious of anyone's possible political motivations, let me assure you that I was asked to do this uh, long, long before uh, there was any uh, discussion of any other interests that I might have in, in, uh, in political life. Um, if you have not seen the exhibit upstairs, uh, I would urge you to, uh, to go and see it, if not tonight, then on uh, another occasion, uh, because it, it is a very stark reminder uh, of uh, the reality of life in Germany after 1933 uh, and uh, the impact that it had on individuals. Uh, I often think that when we hear the statistics and the numbers, we become somewhat immune to understanding that behind every number and every statistic there is a story and many of us in this room are reflective of those stories, but it's important to be reminded of them. Um, I'm going to talk to you this, this evening uh, about what happened to the rule of law uh, in Germany after 1933 uh, and uh, to, to try to connect the awful progress of discrimination and then of the final solution uh, to then talk about the response that the world made to what happened and perhaps some reflections uh, at, uh, at the end. Uh, it will also be a bit of a personal story <coughs> because uh, as I describe, a few years ago, 16 years ago in fact, my wife Arlene and I found ourselves in a little kitchen in a village in Lithuania. The village is called Zhidikai, which, as you can imagine, means town of the Jews. Uh, and uh, Zhidikai was the home of Arlene's mother's family. We had been asked to go there in order to watch the first democratic election in Lithuania in the winter of 1990. And uh, we took the occasion to say that we would like to visit not only where Arlene's family was from, but also where my grandfather's family was, was from. As many of you may know, my grandfather was the eldest son in a Jewish family that went from Lithuania to Scotland, and uh, when he was in Scotland, he married a Protestant girl, this would be a hundred years ago, 
and both families didn't think this was a very good idea. So the story becomes more complicated. This is not their story, but I just wanted to tell you about it. We were sitting in this kitchen, and we had asked if we could meet someone in the village who could tell us what had happened in the war. And uh, people were at first a little nervous and embarrassed and not quite certain, but they said, yes, there is one person who will certainly know what happened and who will be able to tell you. And she was the post mistress. She was the mistress of the post office in the town. She was a very elderly woman, spoke no English, and it was the middle of winter and it was in Lithuania at a very difficult time in that country's history. It was freezing cold and we're sitting in this little kitchen around a coal stove and she's telling us this story. And we were asking her, do you know, did you know the Florences? Did you know the Lantons? The names of, of, uh, of Arlene's uh, mother's family. And she said yes. And she described for us the fact that they had owned a dry goods store in the town. And you know, it's very interesting when you see the architecture of these villages, and we all have images in our head of what the shtetl life was like. But in fact, people had lived together for hundreds of years. And they lived, they lived together. They lived separately, but they lived together. And they all knew each other. People knew, knew each other. They shopped at each other's stores. They, they, knew what was, they knew everybody. So she knew the names of everybody in the village. And uh, we said, well, what happened? And there was a pause. And she said, well, it was the summer of 1941. And of course, the, the, the Russians had, 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 uh, uh, had been there, had taken over. And then the Germans came through when they invaded after the Stalin-Hitler pact was ended by Hitler. And he decided that he was going to invade Germany in 1941, in the summer of 1941. And there was a blitzkrieg across the Baltic countries in the Baltic coast. And as she described it, and as we've subsequently researched what happened, people were literally rounded up in one day uh, and uh, put uh, into the synagogue. Uh, and the next day, we're all uh, force marched to the next town, which is a town called Majeke, and they were all killed. Uh, there, were, there were no camps for the people, for the Jews living in Lithuania at the time. There was no rounding up and the extraordinary trips from one camp to the other. There was pure and simple uh, extermination. Arlene's family on her mother's side had, had left the village in the late 1920s, but countless relatives would have died on that fateful day in, in 1941. It was on that same trip that we discovered that Palanga, which was the seaside town that I was told was closest to where my own grandfather was born, and we discovered that it was just a few miles from Zhidikai. We learned that there were camps for Jewish children at the, at the seaside that summer of 1941. They were all killed as well. As I mentioned, my grandfather's family left for Scotland during the pogroms of the 1890s, but again, with family left, left behind who would all have perished that summer. The anti-Semitism of the Nazis took what was a, a deep based prejudice in Europe of long standing and of unfortunately deep memory, but it took it to a new and sickening height of murder, of order, and of execution. When, when you read Mein Kampf, it doesn't take you more than a couple of pages to understand that for Hitler, the Jews were a truly evil subhuman force. He had managed to convince himself that the Jews were not human, that they were part of a different race. And he convinced himself that they believed they infected everything like a virus, and he thought that their very existence threatened the alleged purity of the Aryan race. And it's a horrible thing to say, but 
you know, people should read Mein Kampf, not, not because, I mean, it's hate literature. It's, it's a terrible, terrible book. But oftentimes people say when they hear a speech by someone, they say, well, he can't be serious. Or uh, surely he didn't mean that. Or we can't, we can't take his words at face value. But tragically and terribly, if you want to understand what happened or what was the thinking behind the way in which uh, the entire German political legal system and indeed the world was literally turned upside down, you have to understand why he thought the way he did and the terrible, terrible consequences that it has. We know that upon seizing power in 1932, that the Nazis began their policy of systematically defining, labeling, and excluding Jews from all professions and all walks of life. And it's here that we confront the difference between what I call the rule of law and the law of rules. The terrible irony of Germany is that it was a rule-based system. People often say, well, there was no rule of law in Germany, but they say there were laws, and there were. There were systematic laws. There were incredibly complicated laws. There were systematic efforts at defining, labeling, excluding, not just Jews, but people who were described as mitzvahs or people who were determined to be of, of a of, of, a, of a lesser status, people who had some other, other quality that defined them in a way that meant they were described or labeled as inferior. And it was an incredibly elaborate system. The Nuremberg Laws, which are of course the best known, which defined who exactly was a Jew, who was of mixed blood, and what the consequences of all these distinctions was, were the systematic implementation of Nazi racial thought. According to Dr. Walter Gross, who in the 1930s was the head of the Reich Bureau for Enlightenment on Population Policy and Racial Welfare, and I'm quoting from an article by Dr. Gross that was written in 1938, good blood and the strength that comes from good blood is given a people only once, and if allowed to degenerate, cannot be regenerated. So according to this completely noxious theory and bogus science, which was the, an important pillar of the way in which the Nazis thought and constructed their system, the Jews had, according to this theory, invaded Germany so that when the Nazis took power, it's estimated that as many as half of the lawyers and doctors in Berlin were Jewish. The theory, and then the brutal practice, was that Germany had to protect itself from this so-called takeover. Hence, the initial laws, which were laws of exclusion. And if you go upstairs, you will see right away what happened. Lee people were not allowed to be citizens. They were not allowed to practice their profession. They were not allowed to participate anymore in the civil life of Germany. They were immediately excluded, labeled, defined, and then excluded. And there were laws forbidding intermarriage and illicit intercourse, and they were designed to prevent the birth of further individuals of mixed blood because they are neither one thing nor the other, to quote from Dr. Gross. Now, the implementation of these laws of incredible and excruciating detail and great cruelty in order to work, in order to be implemented, required an elaborate structure. Jews were denied citizenship. They couldn't practice their profession. They lost property. By 1939, about half of Germany's official Jewish population, which is to say a quarter of a million people, had fled the country with no belongings, with little money, with few places that would welcome them. 
including, to our shame, Canada. The rest stayed and perished. The Nuremberg Laws were followed by Kristallnacht in 1938. Kristallnacht was that awful wave of violence that made it clear to everyone that the oppression of the Jews was not simply a bureaucratic event. It was not simply a matter of depriving people of their civil rights and civil liberties, of labeling, defining them, and excluding them, but it then became a matter of directly oppressing them, of beating them up, of killing them. Hundreds of people were killed on Kristallnacht. It was not just a question of, of, of breaking synagogues and, of, and, of, and of, of busting in stores. People were murdered. The concentration camps had already been set up in the 1930s to imprison the vast population of political dissidents, Jews, gypsies, homosexuals. They were rounded up, they were charged, and they were convicted under laws and decrees that were a feature of this tyranny. Writing for a British audience, Dr. Franz Gertner, who was the Reich Minister of Justice, explained in 1938, and I'm quoting now from the, from the, from the Nazi Minister of Justice in 1938, who said, and I'm quoting, it is sometimes said, even by critics, usually endeavoring to be objective in their judgments, that National Socialism has abolished law in Germany and has substituted arbitrariness in its place. Those who hold that view must be completely ignorant of the principles maintained by National Socialism and of the conditions actually existing in Germany. The new German state is based upon the axiom that law is one of the main pillars supporting the solidarity of the national and the political structure representing it. More than that, a conception of law deeply rooted in the nation's life and recognized as binding by every citizen is the foundation of the country's entire civilization. Now, he goes on to say that, but you have to understand that the Nationalist Socialist Party has a very different understanding of the rule of law. He says, under our doctrine, the needs of the Commonwealth take precedence over those of the individual. This idea dominates National Socialist policy, and its natural corollary is that the rights of the individual must be subordinated to those of the community. And he went on to say one last thing, which is really, I think, shows you the kind of twist in thinking that took place. He said, the written law has ceased to be the sole source of our knowledge of right and wrong. In our country, the question of right or wrong used to be exclusively decided in conformity with the working of the law. But this formal view has now been replaced by the material one, according to which any act, any act detrimental to the interests of the community or conflicting with them is liable to punishment. We believe that the respect for the law will become all the greater the more we absolve the judge from the necessity of taking the letter of the law for his guide and the more we enable him to base his decisions upon its living spirit. So we can see from what even, even in terms of their own thinking and their own propaganda, what they are describing is the way in which the law, as we define the law, the rule of law, is about protecting the rights of the individual. It's about creating a process which applies to the rulers as well as to the ruled. It's about a substantive view of what it means to be a human being and how there are rights which flow from that as we have in our Canadian Charter. And you can see that under the Nazi doctrine, what they are describing 
is simply the principle that the Fuhrer decides what's best for the community, the community takes precedence over the individual, and just in case we haven't written it all down for you, if you ever do something which represents any kind of, a, of an attack on the, on the community as deemed by the judge in court, then we can lock you up. So, the Nazi legal structure became an instrument of oppression. When we think of the rule of law, we think of the opposite of oppression. But instead of which we have this law of rules in which the state is an instrument of oppression, the legal system is an instrument of oppression, and judges and lawyers became active participants in a tyranny that was unmatched in human history. The historians of the Holocaust <coughs> have traced the relentless evolution of Nazi policy. The phase of labeling of exclusion, the phase of oppression, and then the phase of elimination. The invasion of Poland and then further east into the Baltic states and Russia led to the construction of more camps, more mass murder, from a policy of exclusion to this policy of elimination. The Wannsee Conference of 1942 established the objective of what we know as the final solution. The murder, in the end, of over six million Jews in the name of racial purity and the compelling interest of the Nazi Reich. Carrying out this required an incredible body of laws, of decrees, of rules, of order, of structure, of system. And yes, it required not just a few, but thousands of willing executioners, officials, judges, policemen, soldiers, prison guards, all operating under this weight of paper rules, systems of so-called law. Thank God, the structure came crashing down as Russian forces moved inexorably to the west and the Allies made their way back from Normandy to Berlin in 1944 and 1945. I'm almost embarrassed to be quoting from Adolf Hitler at the Bema of Bethsaidic Synagogue, but I'm going to do so. Because his last testament from the bunker just tells us about the terrible, terrible hatred that was in his heart and how it completely perverted his whole understanding of life and of the world. Because the last thing that he said was, and I'm quoting from him, the true culprit behind this murderous struggle, the Jews. Above all, and this is, this is as the world is literally collapsing around him, there's nothing left to his power, nothing left of, of anything. Bombs are falling all around him. And he's saying, above all, I pledge the leadership of the nation and its followers to the scrupulous observation of the racial laws and to an implacable opposition against the universal poisoner of all peoples, international Jewry. So the one thread of his life from beginning to end was this singling out and hatred of the Jews. There are no other threads. It's the one thread which defines him and which defines what happened. So for him to the end, nothing was his fault. Everything was the fault of the victims. Now, the end of the war <coughs> and the realization of what had happened led to the Nuremberg trials which was an effort to reassert the rule of law in the awful face of what had happened. And I know there are controversies around the Nuremberg trials and there are people who feel that they're just an example of victor's justice and, and uh, that you, know, there, you can't really have uh, effective ways of dealing with the consequences of, of, of wars and of, 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 of catastrophes of this kind. But I, I disagree. 
because I think in the period after the end of the Second World War, beginning with the famous Atlantic Charter, which President Roosevelt and Winston Churchill signed together at sea in, uh, in 1942, uh, there was, I think, a conception uh, in, 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 certainly in our countries, in the West, in, in England and in the United Kingdom, in, in, in the United States and in Canada and many, many other countries, that we had to struggle towards some, some other way of seeing the world, that we had to find uh, a, a way of defining what were we fighting for and what was the kind of international order, not simply a political order, but a moral and legal order that we in fact really believed in and we thought had some, had some universal value and universal premise. And, and that was the basis of the Nuremberg trials, to say what took place here were, were crimes against humanity. They were of such a dimension and of such a kind that the people who participated in them had to be brought to account and had to be held responsible. It was not enough for people just to say, it's too bad it happened, we won, you lost, we'll see you later. We had to find some way of explaining what had taken place and some way of holding up to the light of judgment the nature of that experience. Our own Chief Justice, Beverly McLaughlin, has written about the duty of judges to go beyond the, the law of rules to the deeper purposes of justice. And many of you, I hope, will remember the film Judgment at Nuremberg. I. In preparation for this, I watched it again last night and and because uh, I just finished my speech and I wanted to remind myself of, of what had of what had happened in that and that 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 film was was based on a, a, an aspect of the Nuremberg trials, not the not the big political figures, but trying to understand the guts of the administration. How how had this happened? How deep had this infection gone? How had it perverted the administration of justice itself? And so there were some very famous trials about judges who had behaved in a truly oppressive way, as in fact we can see they were encouraged to do uh, by the Minister of Justice. And many of you may remember the judge who was played by Spencer Tracy's final speech. And he says this, he says, the tribunal does say that the men in the dock are responsible for their actions. Men who sat in black robes in judgment of other men, men who took part in the enactment of laws and decrees, the purpose of which was the extermination of human beings, men who in executive positions actively participated in the enforcement of these laws, illegal even under German law. as. He said, and Chief Justice McLaughlin goes on to say, when she's commenting on this same, on this same film, she says, when he says this, I take him to mean that these laws were unconstitutional under higher principles, as affirmed by Germany's history and culture and constitution. Germany today is a great democracy. Germany. Uh, before 1932, under the culture, under the, uh, the Weimar Republic, was a place of, of great freedom, of great literature, of great thought, of great humanity. And so it's not enough for a judge to say, well, I was only following orders, or I was only executing what I thought to be the rules. What is being asserted here is that there is, in fact, an obligation on the part of those of us who believe in the rule of law to see it as a, as a more universal standard. Spencer Tracy said, had the defendants been degraded perverts or had sadistic monsters and maniacs, then these events would have no more moral significance than an earthquake or any other natural catastrophe. And as Beverly McLaughlin says, and she's right, Judges must resist this normalization, this making 
of law that which cannot be just and hence in a profound sense cannot be legal. To do otherwise is to allow injustice to hide itself under the cloak of false legality. Now, we can trace a line from the Nuremberg trials and from the decisions of those courts to, in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations, which was actually drafted by a Canadian, Professor John Humphrey of McGill University. We can trace it to the continuing, often frustrating, difficult efforts to create international norms, to create a sense of what humanitarian and international law is with respect to standards in the conduct of nations. And I found, I can tell you this, in my visits to Israel over the last 25 years, what is remarkable to me and what is in fact defining to me about Israel is that it is a country that is preoccupied with the question of the rule of law. In every meeting I've had with an Israeli official, in every meeting that I've had with an Israeli judge, in every meeting that I've had with an Israeli soldier, they are preoccupied with understanding their obligations under the rule of law. No court has been more active in assessing the conduct of its public officials than the Supreme Court of Israel. So at the risk of, of being even moderately political, I would only say this. There is no other state in the Middle East that compares in terms of its commitment to constitutionalism and to human rights. There is no other place that does it except for the state of Israel. <laughs> justice, justice shall you seek are words that should have real meaning for all of us. There was a hope at the end of the Second World War that because of the awfulness of the Holocaust, because of its impact, because of its devastation, because of its cruelty, because of its inhumanity, because of its, its sickness, its perversity, that somehow simply describing it would be sufficient to make sure that it never happened again. And there was a sense that a new order would emerge from this in which people would say, well, we're certainly never going to go back and allow that to happen again. But the Holocaust is not the last gasp of hatred in the world. There are leaders today in the world who spread vicious lies about Jews and about Israel. In living rooms and in coffee shops in the Middle East, people are watching television programs based on the protocols of the elders of Zion with terrible stories of blood rituals and alleged religious practices. It doesn't stop there. There's a diet of hatred and of racial stereotyping that goes on in many, many different parts of the world. It spreads well beyond the Jews to engulf innumerable conflicts it is literally unbelievable still the hatred that people can feel for one another simply because they're different and not like them. And it is still unbelievable the inhumanity and the cruelty that people will set forth on their fellow human beings. So to affirm the dignity of difference the value of each and every human life, the rights and freedoms which protect this dignity 
and this value is an obligation which we share. It's a profound obligation which we share as Canadians, as human beings. This week, which is a remarkable week in the life of our city and of our community, is in part about the past. And it is part, as Rabbi says, it is in part we're all saying Kaddish in a way. But it's not just about the past. It can't be about the past. It's about our common values and commitments as we go forward. As we go forward in a very uncertain world. As we go forward in a world which is still not rid itself of the disease of racial hatred, of the disease of anti-Semitism, of the disease of stereotyping, of the disease of scapegoating, which we see around the world. I want to close with some words which are very familiar to all of you. But as, as familiar as they are, to me there is a, still a beauty to them that I wanted to share with you again. And they are the words of Anne Frank, who in a famous passage in her diary writes these words. It's a wonder I haven't abandoned all my ideals. They seem so absurd and so impractical. Yet I cling to them because I still believe, in spite of everything, that people are truly good at heart. It's utterly impossible to build my life on a foundation of chaos, suffering, and death. I see the world being slowly transformed into a wilderness. I hear the approaching thunder that one day will destroy us too. I feel the suffering of millions. And yet, when I look up at the sky, I somehow feel that everything will change for the better, that this cruelty too shall end, and that peace and tranquility will return once more. You know, I'm sure that there are today young Anne Franks in refugee camps in Darfur, in places of oppression and darkness in too many places in the world. In paying tribute to the victims and survivors of the Holocaust, we, rededic we rededicate ourselves to a world of security, to a world of peace, to a world of justice, and to a world of reconciliation. Thank you very much.